Hi, this is Bob. Uh, went to the Laporte Ham Fest yesterday in Laporte, Indiana. Really nice ham fest. A lot of people there and a lot of uh, things being sold. I really liked it and I recommend it. Uh, next year maybe you could make the Laporte Ham Fest. We had people from all over coming in there. I talked to a gentleman from Henry, Illinois uh, for, for a while there and there were people from like Illinois and Michigan and Indiana and Ohio and it was just a real nice ham fest. I spotted this on a bench there, bench on a table, and uh, it's a Heathkit VL1180 two meter amplifier. And uh, these were made in the 80s and they are a uh, Let's see that. I got, a, I got a nice sharp picture there on a close-up. I don't want to change it. Anyhow, these were made in the, in the 1980s. Let's put it back like that. Because I'm not able to get the camera to do what I want. And this is more important here anyways. These were made back in the 1980s and they were a, a matching amplifier to go with such rigs as the uh, Heathkit 20 36A, which I've got sitting over here, which I'm using to power this. And uh, I saw this on the uh, table there, and I made the man a ridiculously cheap offer because it did not work, he said, and he didn't know how to hook it up, and he didn't know what was wrong with it. And I thought, well, it's probably got a bad RF transistor, which is the MRF 247 right here. And I thought, well, you know that's tough to change and it's an expensive transistor but uh, he wanted so little for this after we talked for a while he just practically gave it to me so I said okay I'll take it and so I brought it home and uh, I wanted to show you here before I get started uh, with that with what it took to to get it going I wanted to show you how to check uh, those transistors in these units and what you do is you, you set your ohm meter on R times 1. I've got here a Simpson 260 meter, which is a little bit blurry there. I, I think you can see the needle moving though when I, when I do that. And I wanted to show you here that this connection right here is the base of that transistor. The both emitters go to the circuit board ground on either side or the little screws here they're all at ground and the collector is right here so you've got those three connections on that transistor so if you want to check that on the board with your Simpson meter or a similar meter I really prefer an analog meter for doing this and I really like the 260 so anyhow what you do is you put your red lead on here I've got it on R times one I put the red lead here on the base and I put the black lead on the emitter which is the chassis or the the circuit board ground and I'm reading 7 ohms and then I switch I put the black lead here and the red lead goes to the circuit board ground and I'm reading 10 ohms so let me put the meter on here so you can see it so I'm going to put the red lead on the base just like I did and the black one on the circuit board ground and there we have 7 ohms and I'm going to switch and I'm reading 10 ohms. So that shows us that this has got a difference in resistance. Uh, it is not much of a difference because there is a choke on this circuit board and that choke has got a low resistance so if I disconnected the choke which I can do pretty easy then you'll see there's quite a considerable difference now uh, I'm going to go to the collector lead on that transistor I like the MRF 247 they're a rugged transistor um, I'm going to put the red lead on the collector and the black lead on the base up above. Okay, the red lead here on the collector, the black lead on the base up above, 
and I'm reading 100 ohms on the meter. Then I put the red lead on the base and the black lead on the collector, and I'm reading 9 ohms. Now they don't always read exactly the same, but you should see a difference. So that tells me that this transistor is probably good. So I did that yesterday when I brought this home and I thought, oh boy, it doesn't need a new RF transistor. And I was thrilled about that. Those transistors are expensive. And so I was real happy about that. Now, one of the other things that I found with this when I was checking it out was loose hardware. These screws here were loose. This was loose. There's a screw down in here. All of these, all of these little screws were loose and nuts. So I snugged those all down. You don't have to tighten them up really super tight, but uh, you do want to have them good and tight. Uh, these here were especially loose. Another thing I did to this, which is not in the service manual or anything, is there's a ground connection right here on the uh, where the coax is grounded. There's a piece of coax right under here, white coax. And I put a little wire on there, number, number 20, I think it is, bare wire. And I ran it down to the circuit board ground right there to get a better ground to the circuit board right at that point. I did the same thing on both ends here and on the other end where the other coax connector is. I did the same thing. Okay, now the things I found wrong with this were these. I'm using a tripod today it makes for steadier pictures and I can get in closer that way with this camera but uh, it's something else that I have to mess around with. Anyhow, these are uh, metal tab transistor or tr metal tab capacitors. They're a mica capacitor. They can withstand a lot of heat, so you don't have to worry about when you're soldering them down to the circuit board. But they get soldered to the circuit board, and you heat them on both sides and you solder them. Now I used a small, small screwdriver like this, and I scraped on the sides of those. Now the reason I did that was because these were not soldered adequately. They had little globs of solder on the side and they barely made contact. In fact, there was one of them that was not soldered to the circuit board at all. It could, you could just flip it up. And uh, you can't have that, and especially at VHF frequencies. So I scraped on the side with that little screwdriver and I used my uh, Weller 8200 solder gun to solder those down securely to the circuit board and you can see I put quite a bit of solder on those. I want that at VHF. Uh, this is the Weller 8200 solder gun. Some of you guys have got one like that. I really like that for doing that kind of work. You got a lot of heat there and you can solder things like that that require a lot of heat. Those uh, little tab capacitors, metal tab capacitors, have uh, got uh, tarnish on them because they're silver plated and they're old. This thing is what, 35, 40 years old, something like that. So they have tarnish, but really uh, I found that they soldered nicely even under the tarnish. <laughs> no problem. But I did scrape the tarnish off on the sides when I soldered them down to the circuit board. And after doing that, the thing started to work and does an excellent job. I'm getting about 75 watts out with it. They, they get anywhere from 75 to 100 watts out of these, which is real nice. They're a nice little amplifier and they just go and go and go. So if you see one of these at a ham fest, they're worth, uh, they're worth uh, picking up to use for your two meter rig. You can put them in the mobile. They're 12 volts, of course. You can put them in your mobile and you can also uh, uh, use them on the base. I'm going to use this one on the base station here with a, a power supply. The power supply I'm using is a Jetstream 30 amp power supply I got from r &L Electronics and uh, I really like this, the guys there and also uh, this little power supply, Jetstream supply works really good and I haven't detected any RF noise from the Jetstream power supply even on my HF transceiver so I, I like that too. And uh, what else was I going to comment on here? Another thing I ran into with this, woohoo, really spun the camera around that time. Another thing I ran into with this was these wires. 
they were just all over the place in here and when you put the cover on the cover slides down over this edge here and when you put the cover on the wires would go under the cover and you could see the wires were squashed and had been squashed several times and then the major major problem that caused this not to work is right there well I got it here someplace Oh, I, I, was on, I wasn't in the camera. That's a uh, 1 8 inch phone plug. And the, whoever was running this little amplifier wanted to get 12 volts for a, maybe a preamp or something. So he drilled a hole in the end of the amplifier and mounted this. Well, then when he connected it, he connected it to both sides of the switch. He should have connected the one that is grounded, which is this lead right here, should have gone to ground. And this other one here should have gone to the 12 volts hotline there to get the 12 volts for his preamp or whatever he was running and he had those backwards and uh, so he had grounded out the 12 volts which was a dead short so when you turn this thing on the fuse blew another thing that's wrong with it that wire there he never soldered it so that was that was <laughs> one of the main problems with this too. So I got that taken care of. And one thing I did on here that I'll show you real quick and easy. You can see right there, you see this little piece of wire right here? It's a bare piece of wire. It's just a, an old resistor lead. <laughs> I put a little glob of circuit there, a little glob of solder there on the ground side of the circuit board, soldered that little wire there, and I took these wires that were flopping around and getting in under the lid when I put the lid on and just bent this wire around to hold those wires back so they don't do that. I also added a couple of tie wraps. There's a tie wrap right here holding those wires together. And there's another tie wrap up here holding the wires together there. And that's to keep those wires from getting underneath that lid when you put the lid on. So I've been running this thing here for quite a while and it's doing an excellent job. So uh, that's what I wanted to show you on this. I like to make these videos. I like to help other people. I like to help the new guys uh, to learn things about uh, electronics and not be afraid to get in there. Get in there and take things apart, guys. You know, the worst thing that can happen is you wind up with something that doesn't work. And that's what you got to begin with, right? So you're not losing anything. And uh, also, the most important thing that you can have working on electronics of any type is patience, patience, and self-control. Self-control. And I was told a story once uh, by a gentleman. Let's see if I can get that. To... No, for some reason, the the... The camera is not operating like I would like it to. But I heard this story about a gentleman who was working at a uh, watch repair school. And the guy next to him had fixed a watch. He did a beautiful job repairing the watch. And then, uh, and then the uh, teacher came along and, and the man held the watch up and showed it to the teacher. And the teacher said, oh, he said, you've got one thing you haven't done yet. He said, and he put the watch back down in front of the student. And the student, he took the watch all apart again, and he did everything he could think of, and he put it all back together and uh, called the teacher over. He says, well, how is it now? And the teacher said, don't. He says, you still got one thing you didn't do. And so he took the watch apart again, and he took it all apart, and he did everything he could think of, and he put it all back together, and he called the teacher over, and he said, well, how about now? He said, okay, now. And the teacher said, no, you still have one thing you didn't do. And this student got so frustrated, he picked up a hammer that they had nearby, and he smashed the watch. And he says, by golly, you'll never give anybody any trouble anymore, you rotten watch. And he smashed, it, smashed the watch. And the teacher said, why did you do that? He said, because it had something wrong. And he says, I couldn't find it. And I got so frustrated. And the teacher said, well, he said, I'll tell you what was wrong with it. And he said, you had a nice, big, 
fingerprint right on the middle of the crystal on the watch. All you had to do was wipe it off. <laughs> so, so have patience with these things, guys. Have patience. So that's, uh, that's the VL1180 uh, Heathkit 2 meter amplifier. I couldn't find any information on this on the internet at all. And so if anybody has got the schematic in that and you could uh, maybe post it in the Vintage Heathkit uh, website or, or something like that, that would be real nice because I did not have the schematic for this. I just went by memory when I was working on it. And the fact that I know that so many of these have got loose hardware and poor solder connections and things like that. So that was enough information for me to get this going. But uh, I really like to do this kind of thing, to, like I say, to help the new guys and to help those out there work on their own equipment and also to keep this information so that it doesn't get lost. Uh, there's a lot of things we learned working in the Heathkit uh, service department and uh, it, we don't want this stuff to be uh, lost, we want it to be maintained for uh, other people that want to work on these things. So that's the deal there. It's a really nasty day here today. It's snowing outside. The wind is blowing up to 60 mile an hour gusts and they say it may get worse tonight. How about that? Great for staying in and working on the ham radio stuff. The best hobby there is. So 73's everybody and Heath Kits forever. <laughs>